Hello everybody, so this is the lecture on the environmental footprint. Um, the thing is, I want to start this lecture thinking about this simple question, where does pollution come from? Now a lot of people, when they think about this, they think about, oh, okay, that power plant and that smokestack where this, or maybe this is some sort of factory, it's actually an electrical power plant, but um, that's where the pollution comes from. It comes from that tailpipe of that car exhaust. But when you think about it, it's really not the, let's say, fault of the power plant, it's really us, we, us people that are plugging in things into outlets, demanding that power, using that power, us driving that car, making the choice to drive that car, making the choice to plug in whatever appliance or thing that we're trying to make, use power for. So uh, when we think about where does a pollution come from, well, it really comes from us, our choices, and what we do. Now, a way to think about this is the idea of an environmental footprint or an ecological footprint. And what that footprint is, is the amount of land um, required to supply the resources and absorb the waste of a person. Okay, so I think that uh, basically how much land does it create, do, do you need to supply everything that you need, so food, energy, whatever, um, all the materials and take the waste of that person in a sustainable way okay um, and this is basically determined by our lifestyle where we live um, and the choices that we make so I wanted to spend some time going to this footprintcalculator.org and this is a website that is going to be uh, that we can use to basically um, see how much land is required for you. And I'll do this for myself, okay? Uh, I gotta enter my email. I have a bunch of emails on here, but okay. Let's see, okay, how often do you eat animal-based products? Um, really like veggies, occasional meats, meat and eggs, dairy. Yeah, I think that would be right about where I'm at. I don't eat meat all the time. Um, when I do eat meat, it's not a lot of beef, but how much of the food that you eat is unprocessed, unpackaged, or locally grown? How much of the food that you eat is unprocessed? Um, I don't actually eat that much processed food. I do a lot of my own cooking, so I'll say 20%. Again, this is just um, an estimate. Which housing type best describes your home? Uh, I do have running water, and it is my own home. Okay, no one else is living next to me or anything. Uh, what material is your house constructed with? Yep, okay, it is wood. How many people live in your household? I have four people. What is the size of your house? I don't actually know. Lar it's not a large home. Let's say a medium home. It's pretty, but that's, I think my square footage is higher than that. Uh, let's, I don't know, let's go there, okay. Do you have electricity in my home? Yes. How energy efficient is your home? Actually, I have a pretty new home that is pretty energy efficient. Our windows are really good. You have a really good heating thing. Okay. So what percentage of your home's electricity comes from renewable sources? I have no idea. So let's just say zero, probably not that much. Um, compared to your neighbors, how much trash do you generate? I do have two children, one baby that has a whole bunch of diapers, but I, I, you know, I do sometimes am kind of nosy looking. I do have less than a lot of people. Uh, how far do you travel by car or motorcycle each week? I do not own a motorcycle. I don't drive. My, I live in Whitewater, so I would say that. Meh, yeah, probably more than that. Whatever, not very much. Average fuel economy, I have a really fuel efficient car that gets 45 miles to the gallon, doesn't matter. When you travel by car, how often do you carpool? Never. How far do you travel on public transportation? In Whitewater, zero. How many hours do you fly each year? This is one of the things I really do like flying. I probably fly somewhere around 20 hours a year. Um, I like to do a lot of international travel. So, all right, so if everyone lived like me, oops, if everyone lived like me, we would need 2.8 Earths. So let's see those details. Um, 
a lot of that is the carbon footprint, okay? Uh, and then, so cropland, this is basically how much 1.3 giga hectares, so a million hectares I would need. And what we see is food is the biggest portion for me. Um, and mobility then moving around is not, or is the um, second biggest thing. So, um, yeah, let's now go back to this lecture here. Generally what we see is uh, my results are pretty, pretty much common. Um, the two biggest things that um, the average American, you know, the two biggest components of their ecological, ecological or environmental footprint is energy generation or food production. Um, and what we see is basically the ecological footprint of everybody on Earth. How many Earths would we essentially need for everybody? Is we're 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 continuing up. It's been this upward trend, okay? As more and more countries are getting more developed and using more resources, we're seeing, you know, and we have seen an increase in the last 50, 60, 70 years. So the, the question is now that we're here at 2020, have we started to flatten this curve? Have we made, um, you know, improvements? And essentially, no, we haven't. We're continuing on this upward trend. So right now we're seeing that we need about one and a half Earths needed for the current population and our population is continuing to grow. Now for Americans, it's, uh, you know, we're towards the top. These are, um, you know, just a Wikipedia list of the countries by their ecological footprint. Um, and we're not, you know, near the top, but out of the 100 and 80 some countries we have on the planet were what are we number one two three four five six okay um and so this is where the ecological footprint in giga giga hectares per person and we're at eight giga hectares per person that's that's the average for the for an, for an american um and you see that the uae Qatar, and bahrain so these are those uh, persian gulf states that uh, basically use a ton of oil so for their their entire economy is oil based and they have a lot of money to spend so that's why it, it, it's up high but then we see Denmark Belgium Estonia Canada now it's interesting that these countries here are in relatively cold climates so a lot of that um, that ecological footprint is actually due to heating their homes um, I would say the reason the United States is up so high on this list is because of the amount of consumer goods that we we consume. And so th so this idea of this e ecological footprint really applies to another idea called the tragedy of the commons. So it comes from a, a theory in the 1960s that came out uh, by a guy named Garrett Hardin and he was looking at the medieval practice of, of free grazing land. So the medieval practice of England was they would, the king opened up a lot of his land and said, anybody can graze on this land, okay? Now, so what we see is if only a few people use that resource, the free grazing lands for their sheep, it's no problem. There's plenty of grass for everybody. Okay, but as we get more and more, in this case, sheep ranchers, people, you know, growing sheep, um, you get more, it gets more and more crowded. So the way to maximize your individual success, basically to get the most amount of grass for your sheep for free, is to use that resource quickly before everyone else. Okay, so if you're going out and wanting to use that, um, grow your sheep, you need to, you know, have your sheep out there before everybody else can get that. And I think this idea is, is kind of clear as a, you know, a traffic jam. And you can see everyone here is, is saying, if these idiots would just take the bus, I could be home by now, right? What's, you know, everybody's saying that here. They're all using that resource. 
and then it's no good for anybody. So what we see is kind of over and over again, pretty much any um, resource that we're talking about, if you have shared ownership, so who owns the highways? Well, nobody really owns the highways, right? Um, who owns the oceans? Nobody owns the ocean. So people use highways, even though it, it's too crowded, they overexploit it. People fish things out of the ocean and catch too many fish, right? So, um, and I think this lies at the heart of a lot of environmental problems, and we'll kind of express this or explore this idea throughout the, the class here. So the question might be, how do you improve your footprint? And again, I'll say, just wait for that. We're going to spend some time kind of throughout a lot of the, this course looking at how ways that you could potentially increase or decrease your individual footprint. So along those lines, though, it's really interesting that how corporations can essentially take control of this or try to influence people. Um, and one of the bad ways that a lot of corporations will try to do this is by this idea called greenwashing. So uh, McDonald's. Um, McDonald's wanted to have more of a environmentally friendly um, the like outlook or they said they were trying to be more environmentally friendly really all they did was paint a lot of their stores green so rather than the you know red and yellow logo they had a green and yellow logo and then they put up some a couple of signs that said you know be environmentally conscious that kind of thing but they didn't really change any of their practices whatsoever and what we see is that like a lot of companies really do this. So and every, you know, the end of April or every April, NBC will put a little green logo on the bottom of their screen and throw a couple advertisements up about being environmentally friendly, even though they do absolutely nothing to, um, to help the, the environment in any way, really. Another example is organic cotton mattresses. I remember when my nephew was born, my my brother's uh, mother-in-law bought them an organic mat organic cotton mattress. And I thought that was really funny because sure, there is some organic cotton in the mattress, but for it to be a certified mattress that people could sell, they have to spray fire retardants on it. So it had a bunch of the worst chemicals um, that every mattress frankly has um, that would stop fire because cotton is flammable and um, so it needed actually more fire retardants than say a normal mattress that doesn't have as much cotton. Um, so there's plenty of examples of Huggies just putting pure and natural and you know it really isn't environmentally friendly at all. But there are good examples of companies that try to um, have environmentally friendly practices at the heart of their business model. So um, seventh generation, you might see, have seen these products in stores. Um, I've used some of them. Some of them are okay. Some of them I don't like. But their idea was to um, try to make environmentally friendly like house, household products, cleaning products, uh, paper products and things that lots of recycling is done with them and then they try to use the chemicals that they do use in their cleaning products are non-persistent and break down and biodegradable and come from sustainable sources in the first place. Uh, another example is the New Belgium Brewing Company. It's one of my favorite brewers. Um, they're in Golden, Colorado um, and they try to recycle um, a lot of their waste and that they're, they're improving on this every year um, and they sell 180 million dollars per year of beer so these companies are actually big uh, really big companies that do have environmentally friendly practices on you know at at their the heart of their business uh, another example is Patagonia so um, a lot of their clothing they're trying to switch over to more environmentally environmentally friendly materials. Um, they donate a lot of their profits. Well, I, I mean, that's not a 1% is not a lot of their profits, but out of, you know, 
$540 million per year, that's still $5 million a year. That's not bad, right? Um, and uh, employees, I forget how often they can do this, but they can get paid vacation if they work for an environmental group. And I think that, you know, sure, okay, the company is losing 1% of their profits, but that's it's okay. A lot of people probably buy things from Patagonia because they know that Patagonia is doing good things for so it, for the environment. So it might, you know, pay off in the long run. And that might be um, part of their motivation for doing this. But honestly, like, I'm okay with that. If it's helping the environment, great. Um, I love it. All right. So that's it for this lecture. And I'll see you all later.